Welcome, it's Rick Fox. How are you, Rick? I'm great, Jay. How are you? Man, it's great to see you. Just reminiscing about the good old days. Tell us a little bit about, um, first off, who were your musical heroes? Growing up, who were the bands that really got you into wanting to play music yourself? I, I don't think we have enough time for that. <laughs> uh, oh, God, let's see. Well, the reason I got into music, rock music, was uh, uh, in the seven, 60s, uh, I saw Steppenwolf on TV, yeah. and, and uh, Nick St. Nicholas is yeah. wearing a fringed buckskin jacket, he's playing a white Rickenbacker 4001, leather pants, and he's just standing there kind of just, I'm like, that guy looks so cool, <laughs> that's what I want to do, I want to be like that guy, Right. And, and, I, and I was like 13 years old, I started my music interest pretty much uh, rock, the heavy rock stuff with Steppenwolf. I mean, I'd, I'd heard Amboy Dukes on the radio and Status Quo pictures of Matchstick Men. This is all, you know, in the 60s, but uh, it's pretty much with Steppenwolf all the way, you know. Um, I, I liked Gary Puckett and the Union Cap because they looked like a band. They looked like a gang. They looked like a team. They all wore Civil War, Union Civil War uniforms. So there was no mistaking that they, they might be in another band. Mm -hmm. So I, I dug the uniformity of how they looked. But I like the sound of Steppenwolf. Yeah. So my first two albums that I got when I turned 13 from my cousin was The Beatles' Rubber Soul, which had just come out, and, and uh, Steppenwolf's first album. Mm -hmm. And I just went with Steppenwolf. And I never looked back since. That's mm -hmm. how I got into, into music. And since then, it was uh, bands like Uriah Heep and Sweet, Slade. Um, God, there's so many. Uh, Judas Priest, Alice Cooper, mm. you know. Uh, I remember in Queens going to Alexander's to the mall and getting my, my first copy of Love It to Death. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like I said, it was like my first steps down the rap, the pre steps down the rabbit hole. Yeah. And it changed the, the course of my life. I'm 18, the whole yeah. deal. Yeah. Well, so. talk about how you eventually moved out to LA and, you know, tell us about the Wasp story. Well, I have to pre preamble that a little bit by saying that um, I made my first professional debut live at the legendary Max's Kansas City Club mm -hmm. in New York City. That was the scene. You know, we have the Rainbow in L.A., but it, this is bands weren't playing in the Rainbow. It was just a restaurant. Max's was a restaurant and a club, and upstairs in the back was the, the big stage, and or main stage, I should say. And, um, and this is where the New York Dolls played. And Aerosmith, Alice Cooper, they got mm -hmm. their deals through there, um, and, and it was a legendary place to play. Um, I, was, I was rubbing shoulders with the Ramones, uh, uh, Tough Darts, Jane, Wayne County, Jane County, uh, all of the hot bands of... The dictators of, around? Yes, dictators were around then too, yeah. Anybody was anybody was as, always at Max's. It was like a family, you know. Um, so I played there with a group called the Martian Rock Band. I debuted on Halloween 1975. And uh, at, at that point, I was baptized into the scene, and I was hanging out with all of the, the bigger, more famous people who went on to be even bigger and famous and, and yeah, so forth. quite a scene. Um, and then from there, I, I wound up playing over in Jersey with a band called Virgin. Uh, this is the original Virgin, not the L.A. Virgin. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were a cover band, you know, glam cover band. We did all the mm -hmm. Alice Cooper, Kiss, Bowie, Mata Hoopals, you know, all that, that mm -hmm. stuff. And we wore the eight-inch platform boots, mm -hmm. eight-inch heels, and... and I made an outfit that looked like Angel. It was all white, you know, and I played a precision bass, and and uh, you know we could do that. You know, there was a there was a crowd for it. Glam yeah. was really big in the clubs. Twisted Sister had Long Island, mm -hmm. so we were playing in Jersey, and then uh, uh, from there I went up in another cover band. It was it was like live jukeboxes. It was, that yeah. was the business in Jersey and, and Staten Island, Long Island. We had all these bands playing cover circuits. Nobody was doing originals yeah. until Twisted Sister really started trying to push it. Right. So but get, uh, getting paid to do it. That's the other thing. Yeah. Is, is I, I got a gig with a group called the E. Walker Band. I was number seven out of eight bass players in that <laughs> band. Uh, but we played uh, six nights a week. So that was my day job. It was my day gig. Uh, I made cash money. And Monday was my only day off. You know. And uh, from there, um, I, I recorded with them. They, I don't know if they ever released uh, anything they've ever recorded. But we... I have two cassette tapes where the demos I did with them. And then uh, I left E. Walker and joined a, a heavier band uh, called Aggressor, which had Dave Ferrara, who was on Mike Varney's uh, U.S. Metal series 
and he had a song called Aggressor. So that's what we named the band, was Aggressor. And we did all of the top 40 metal songs, Van Halen, Scorpions, Black Sabbath, mm -hmm. uh, whoever was the heaviest bands, we did that. And at that time, I got contacted uh, from, by Blackie Lawless. This is like the end of 81, the fall of 81 towards the winter. So he was originally from New York? I found out. Yeah. How long had he been out in L.A.? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I found out that he, he said he played guitar with the New York Dolls on the very last tour. What turns out to be, um, and I'm, I'm friends with Sylvain from the Dolls, mm -hmm. what turns out is uh, Blackie played the last two shows with the Dolls, uh, unannounced. It, it, people thought he was, he was Johnny, mm -hmm. but he was replacing Johnny Thunders. And they teased his hair so he looked like Johnny. And he said, just stand on the side of the stage. And, and he played the very last two shows. There's no photos that I know of in existence of him mm -hmm. playing with them. No recordings that I know of in existence mm -hmm. of him playing with the dolls. But we accept his words saying he played with the dolls and Sylvain validated that. So that was it, just the two shows with, with, with the dolls. Uh, Blackie got my number uh, from somebody, some people who were vacationing in, in, in uh, New York. And his, at his invitation, he convinced me to come out to LA, which I did. I arrived on February 4th, 1982. Him and Tony and uh, um, Blackie Tony and uh, Randy picked me up, and they had Mike Solon with them. Uh, Mike Solon, for, for the people who know Kiss, Mike Solon is Eddie Solon's brother. Eddie Solon was Ace's tech and, and sound man for Kiss. So Mike had a car that worked, Blackie's car was working, so Mike drove us around. So they picked me up, they took my gear to uh, Magnum Opus, to Randy's studio. I went to Blackie's house and, and caught up on the jet lag, sleep and everything. The next night he took me to the Rainbow, or took me to the Troubadour. We met David Lee Roth. Half an hour later we went to the Rainbow. Now we're sitting with David Lee Roth. I mean, how often does that happen for anybody? First time in L.A., you know. Yeah. And, and uh, so right after that, a day or so after, I got to actually audition. And the band was called Sister. It's not called Wasp. It wasn't called Circus Circus. It was called Sister. Yeah. And, uh, and Nicky Six had been in that band previous? No, he was in London. Oh, that was London, that's London. right. Yeah, Blackie was yeah. Blackie were in London. But Chris Holmes was in Sister at some point. His, you know, oddly enough, his name never came up. Okay. I never heard, Blackie, we'd sit in his, his house, his rented house there on, on Los Palmas, and he told me a lot about what he was doing when he first got to L.A., and I would play with, with Arthur Kane from the Dolls, Killer mm -hmm. Kane and all that. Uh, but Chris Holmes' name that I could, never came up. Hmm. You know, he, he talked about Sister. But, yeah, uh, Chris know. talks about the story that he was in the band yeah, but yeah. didn't really like it. And they had a t-shirt with a pentagram, inverted pentagram, and it said the word Sister in lowercase letters, and it was flames in the pentagram. I had I lost the shirt over the years. So anyway, they show me the songs, and I'm sitting there, and it took me back to when I was in the loft in Manhattan watching Kiss rehearse. Because I was part of that whole, I, I mm -hmm. dated one of Peter Chris's sisters, mm -hmm. so I had access to watching Kiss form before even Ace was in the band. But mm. you could, there was that that electric magnetism, that thunder, something about you knew Kiss was going to be a big. I felt the same way watching Wasp. They showed me the songs. I got up, uh, I played with them. Um, it took them, I guess, two two days or so to figure out what they wanted to do. And uh, by February eighth, I have this in my my diary calendar. Uh, I was accepted into the band, so I was then in Sister. Blackie mm -hmm. said, you know, we got our guy, you're it, you got the gig. I said, oh great, this way now I have to fly me back to New York. Um, so I was living at Blackie's house and we were rehearsing, 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 rehearsing. Um, about two months into that, uh, I got a phone call from a friend in New York. Blackie's in the house, he's slumped in a chair like just watching the Yankees game. And I'm walking around the courtyard, and, and I tell people the story, and sometimes, like telephone, it gets altered over how many people hear it. Mm -hmm. But as they say, I'm on the phone, I'm, I, I had a long line, I'm, I'm out in the courtyard, I'm on the phone talking to somebody, I'm just aimlessly kicking over leaves. And I kicked over a leaf, and there was this bug there, and I stepped on it. And, and I, as I kicked the leaf back over again, it was a hornet. And I didn't crush it completely, the stinger was still moving. And even in death, this thing was angry, and it was just like reminded me of the old Green Hornet logo mm -hmm. from the '60s, with, with the optic design and, and the hornets like this coming. And something just hit me, and I, I, I went back in the house, and I hang on a second on the phone. Hey, Blackie, I got an idea. You know, you were telling me that you want to reform this. You, you want Sister to be something. You need a new. He said, I need a new name. We need a new identity, a new name. There's too many bands using Sister. There's White Sister in L.A. There's Twisted Sister in New York. 
it's too generic. He goes, we need something that's different from what anybody has ever done. I said, I got an idea for a band name. And he's like, what? And I said, Wasp. I just stepped on one outside. And he's, he goes, I like that. That's a good idea. He goes, keep thinking like that. And the next time we were at rehearsal, at the rehearsal's over, he calls Tony and, and, and uh, Randy over and he says, we got a new name for the band. And then Randy goes, well, I wanted to call a band Hellion, because he's from Texas. You know, he says, that's what they call bad kids, is Hellions. I said, I think there's already a band up in L.A. called Hellion. I've seen the name around in the papers. Um, and and uh, so he says, well, what? And, and I, Blackie goes, Wasp. And Tony goes, Wasp? Who names a band after a bug? And I said, it just came to me. I said, the Beatles? <laughs> Scorpions? Mm -hmm. You know, and Randy started laughing, and, and, and he, that was it. That was the moment Wasp was born. Now, technically speaking, since I suggested the name, Blackie confirmed it. Blackie, myself, Randy, and Tony are the band members. At that moment, we are the four original founding members of Wasp. It's a new band. It's not Sister. This is being debated all over social media. And that, it doesn't matter how many people don't like that that way of thinking about it, but that's actually, you can't deny that. All the four of us are the original founding members. You know, now since then there are people who say, who disagree and say, no, the founding original members are the guys who went, did the first album, did the first tour, did the, got the gold records, blah, 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 blah. That's comforting to those people, but that's not technically the original founding members of the band. Sure, making an album doesn't change the founding. Well, Tony did the first album with them and right after that he got fired. Yeah. You know, Blackie fired him. So, you know, people like to nitpick. You know, if, if it takes them out of their comfort zone, they don't, they're not comfortable with that, it becomes abrasive, and they start to, to protest. And they, they say, no, that's not true, and they try to dismiss it. You can't dismiss the historical facts. That's the moment Wasp was born. Where did you guys rehearse at? Magnum Opus, which was in an industrial facility in Buena Park. Okay. Randy had, he rented it, and he got the licensing permits done so that... He could, they could play loud music from like 6 p.m. till, I don't know, 6 a.m., Yeah, you know. And, and uh, other bands rehearsed there. There was several other drum risers. The first one on the left belonged to Exciter, which was George Lynch and Mick Brown, mm -hmm. pre docking you know. And, uh, and we had the, the big spot in the back of the room, so we had the whole, the most room of, of anybody to rehearse there. And we played about half a dozen of the songs that are on the first album. Uh, Blackie got the idea to do a demo, so he sets up a recorder. We did a live three-track demo. Okay, this is no overdubs. This is just straight shot. Mm -hmm. You know, vocals, everything. It's all live. There's no re-recording. There's no overdubbing on this. And we did the songs, which now are on YouTube. They're all over YouTube. Um, on my copy of the, we transferred it to the cassette. On my copy, uh, also during this time. Uh, Blackie had called up Don Atkins Jr., who was Motley Crue's first photographer. Uh, Don arranged a photo session at his parents' house. We went over there and we did photos as Wasp. It was this was Blackie's idea. Let's let's do a let's do a band photo. Okay, we got the lineup. It's set. Let's do it. Um, so we we I took the band photo and kind of reduced it on, on a cassette flap and just redrew a logo, just you know whatever artwork and. And I called it Face the Attack. Well, it was in a car that got stolen with half of my record collection. And so when I was moving from one place to another, whoever had got possession of that tape knew what it was or knew what the value would be. And it began being tape traded around the world, pirated everywhere amongst collectors. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't know that it was just my copy of the tape that, that got stolen. So they started referring to it as Face the Attack as the first Wasp demo. And it also had a song on it that, that we never used, was, that I co-wrote with Blackie called Master of Disaster. Uh, that mm -hmm. got cut off, and he never, you know. There's uh, a belief amongst the fans that he, he, he saved it, he chopped it up, and he re, rearranged it to become Wild Child. Because if you hear Wild Child and Master of Disaster side by side, there's parts of it that sound very much like the same song. Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, and four months later, uh, Blackie comes to me one day out of the clear blue. She says, sit down, we got to talk. I said, What's up? He says, uh, it's not working out. So Randy's not happy, uh, Tony's not happy. And 
uh, I'll pay your way back to, to the East Coast, or you can stay out here and, and you know, take a shot. He goes, but you obviously can't stay here. So now I'm cut off. I'm out of a band. I don't know why. You know, obviously, I mean, the tape kicked ass. Mm -hmm. You know, I, you know, what didn't work? You know, and at that point, he said to me, uh, Blackie says, looks at me in the eye, he goes, you are not to have possession of any of the photos. You're not to be able to, have, you know, in other words, you can't prove you were in this band. You're not to possess any any materials that you, well, I had the demo. Couldn't take that away from me. So he had gone out for the day. I'm saying to myself, screw this. I grabbed some of the negatives. I went up to Sunset Boulevard. I made some pictures made. I mean, it's, it, this is my experience. I'm, I'm entitled to this, mm -hmm. you know. And, and then when I got back, he found out that I got the negatives. He was livid, absolutely livid. And he started yelling at me like I was some little kid. And, and he demand, I gave him the negatives. He goes, give me all the pictures. Well, fortunately, I had a couple tucked away, which now are all over the Internet. Mm -hmm. And I gave him whatever else I had. And, uh, you know, that just kind of put the nail in the coffin. He was just furious with me. And uh, now I'm cut off. So I kind of floundered around L.A. I didn't know anybody. I was trying to network. I don't know who, who to make friends with. You know, I, uh, I rehearsed for a little while with a group called Warlord out in, out in uh, North Hollywood. Yeah, they were right here. Like Magnolia. a ship in Magnolia. Yeah, my and there's a loft up around yeah. the back. It's a theater. But a pussycat theater yeah. there. Yep. Yeah, so I rehearsed with them for a couple of months, two, three months, whatever. It was the most complex music I ever had to learn. It was just like Rush meets, meets Sabbath. Yeah. You know, it was very, very Maybe, complex stuff. Yeah. But they told me they never had any intention of playing out live. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I'm, I'm all for playing live. What's the sense of rehearsing if you're not going to play live? I said, well, this is what we want to do. We, wanna, we, we don't want to play live. We're just going to record. And I said, all right, well, that's not going to work out. Um, I met Anne Boleyn, uh, and we, she asked me if I wanted to jam with them, and I, I jammed with, with Hellion for, for a while, you know, a few week or two, three, I don't know. Uh, we played, a, And I put an ad in Music Connection magazine. And I said, you know, bass player from New York, formerly with Wasp. Nobody contended it then. Everything was fine up until 30 years later. Nobody mm -hmm. said boo about me being in Wasp. You know, they had plenty of years to complain and say, no, it never happened. But anyway, so I got a call from Ron Keel. And he said, uh, you know, I, I uh, let go of my entire band. Uh, when I got to L.A., I saw what kind of bands I was up against with Steeler. He says, in order to, to meet or beat or exceed those kind of bands, I need those kind of players. Says, and, and the guys he had were great. He had some really good mm -hmm. musicians. Nothing against them playing-wise. Yeah. I guess he felt there was an image thing that he had to compete against in L.A. You know, you had Motley Crue, Rat, you know, Black and Blue had just come to town. Yeah. You know, even the, the Black and Blue's drummer, Pete, same haircut as Nicky Six. In the early Black and Blue pictures looked like Nicky Six playing drums. So anyway, um, hi Pete. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, I, he, I, I went over to where the Steeler was rehearsing. It was it's jokingly referred to as the Steeler Mansion. Yeah. Big, Washington Boulevard, west of La Brea. Right. We were the only white guys in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. And it was three, as you know, it was three gutted Store. out stores the just only, the support walls. You have to walk up to the liquor store. Right. And it was anything. encrusted with, with roaches. Oh. Roaches. I mean, you, you walk into the kitchen at night, and you go to turn on the gas on the stove, and you can hear the this little tippity tappity tippity tappity tippity. It's the roaches hitting the floor in the newspapers and running. So uh, it was very of course. Spartan. Poison moved into the mansion Afterwards. after yeah, that. Yeah, that's how I got to meet Poison. Yeah, I am bonded with them. But anyway, so I meet with Ron. I walk in in the rehearsal room. It's just the drum riser and Ron sitting there with his flying V. And and he says. We talked, you know, obviously, you know, broke the ice. Uh, I told him I was, I was about my story about Kiss and how I knew the guys and Kiss. He was a big mm -hmm. Kiss fan. Mm -hmm. I said all of the moves that they learned, mm -hmm. you know, from Sean Delaney taught stars. I said I learned those from those guys. I was friends with Sean Delaney, um, and he, and he, he kind of liked where the vibe was going. He says, "Here, here's a tape. Learn the songs." He goes, "Come back, and if 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 I'm happy, we'll we'll take it from there." I said, "That's fair enough." So I took the songs back to where I was living. I, I learned the songs. I went back, I sat down, just Ron and I, and we just played. I guess he liked, obviously, what, what, where it was going. Um, the drummer came back. Mark was in Texas visiting relatives. He had come back, and he goes, oh, so you're the new bass player, huh? And I understand that, because you don't want to get too chummy with a guy you might have to fire, you might have to let go in case it doesn't work. And I have to say, even though I've played with all of these cover bands and all these clubs, night after night after night after night, 
I learned the most about what being a rhythm section was about by playing with Mark. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark and I used to rehearse just together, just the two of us. Shut the door, bass and drums. And we'd, we'd work it out, fine tune it. We were like, you couldn't fit a piece of paper in between us. You know, I learned about playing ahead of the beat, behind the beat, on the beat. All the stuff they listened to with, with the drummer. And we got really tight. We'd rehearse that way for hours. Then we'd take a break, we'd have dinner. Then Mark, uh, Ron would come in and we'd rehearse that way. Or later when we got Ingve, then Ron and Ingve would come in and we'd rehearse as a whole band. So, you know, I was rehearsing with them until, you know, Ron called up Mike Varney and said, listen, I got a band reformed. So Ingve was in the band already when no, you came in? Okay. No. So you were there when he showed I, up? I, I was officially accepted into Steeler by December of 82. Okay. So, not bad. I arrived in February. By December, I was in Steeler. And, and uh, I got that gig. And then uh, Ron called up Varney. He says, we're looking for the, the guitar player from hell. He says, we're in L.A., man. You know we got to compete. We know what we're up against. Mark, Mike says, I got a couple of guys I want you to hear. And one of them, which was Ingve Malmsteen. Mm -hmm. And we just sat there and went, holy cow. I mean, Eddie Van Halen was the biggest thing at that point. Right. You know, Eddie, Eddie had changed the trend. He raised the bar. Yeah. You know, and, and so... Uh, Little Randy Rhodes. Yeah, well, I didn't know about Randy at that point. Right. He was he was already an Aussie. Yeah. He was out of Quiet Right. He was already an Aussie at that time. So I didn't know that much about Randy Rhodes until later. Um, but I mean, I had met Kevin Debro, Rudy Sarzo. I, I, the guys were really nice to me, uh, especially when when with Steeler we we supported Quiet Right at Perkins Palace, and Rudy was so the guys one of the most nicest people in the business. Yeah. I don't know how this guy never got stepped on for <laughs> how nice he is. You know, and, and took me aside and said, hey, you know, welcome to the ranks, man. You're, you're kind of in with us now, and, you know, you're working your way up. So I just want to, you know, give you a little uh, uh, assertive, not assertive, uh, um, uh, acknowledgement, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and good on you kind of thing. So anyway, so getting back to, to uh, we get the tape, we're listening to Ingve, and then Mike Varney arranges a three-way conversation. So you got Ingve and Sweden on the phone, Mike Varney up north, and, and then us down here. And we're talking, and anybody's like, man, I can't wait to come to L.A., I can't wait to be in your band, and I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. Sounds very encouraging. You know, we heard your stuff, it's, it's hot, it's great, looking forward to it. Ingve arrives, LAX, we go to pick him up, and here comes Ingve walking down, walking down the uh, exit. I'm here. Like, like MacArthur, making his return to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we go back to the Steeler Mansion, you know, after we get rested up. And we start to go over the songs, you know, and, and of course, Ingve was very uh, disheartened at the surroundings. He didn't realize what kind of conditions he was going to be walking in. He was expecting a clean place, yeah. something civil, not, not roach infested and, and, you know, paint peeling off the walls. Right, and, sleeping on the couch. Yeah, he was not happy with that. And the way he slept was, was in that back, the, 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 where the kitchen room was, where the big water bed was. Mm -hmm. So he slept in the room that had the most roaches. Ooh. And uh, it got to a point where we were rehearsing one day, and Ingve, we stop, and Ingve says to Ron, look, man, is there anything you can do to these songs to make them, like, a little more interesting? Ron goes, what do you mean, interesting? He goes, man, they're, like, really simple. You know, I mean, there's no challenge here. Is, is there something you can do to, to make them more challenging or something more, more interesting? And, and I'm looking at Mark, and Mark's looking at me, and... and, and Ingve is just all but literally telling Ron this this stuff sucks mm -hmm. to his face. He's telling Ron these songs are like really weak. And Ron just did the fastest slow burn, just turned red. And Mark and I are like, oh shit, the new guy is just just insulted the band leader's songs. <laughs> uh, that wasn't going well, to say the least. Right. He he wanted progressive stuff and this was more Judas Priest yeah well Def you know, Leppard and Ingve at that point wasn't really happy with me as a bassist I can tell you I mean let's look at, at, at Steeler's material it's not rocket science right it's three chord rock and roll I, there's no need for Getty Lee stuff in there mm -hmm. or, or anything very intri uh, intricate yeah you know it's not space rock it's not I played what I was told to learn so don't look Straight at me ahead. and say I'm, I'm a shitty bass player I played what had to be played and if he's thinking that Ron's material at that time was was weak, he's obviously going to be looking at me and think I'm weak. He liked Mark, he liked the drummer. So how soon did you go to make the record from well, there? What happened is Ron Ron started auditioning other guitar players, right in front of Ingve while he was living there. 
we had two or three other, four other guys come in and, and audition, and anybody finally said, you know what, I, I, I get it. I, I'll, I'll play the game. I'll, I'll play it. I'll, I'll do it your way. And he learned the songs. Now we're rehearsing. First show was uh, in March of 80, 82, 83. I'm sorry. Uh, we opened for Hughes Thrall. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I met, uh, uh, I didn't know Glenn Hughes that well, but I met Pat Thrall when he was with, with Pat Travers sure. in New York at the Palladium. And, and so after the show, I introduced myself to Pat. Pat was standing in the doorway behind my, by my bass gear with his jaw on the floor watching Ingve as we opened for them. And afterwards, in the green room, I said, Pat, you remember I met you at the, at the, at the, the Palladium in New York? You were Pat Travis. He goes, oh, my God, but you're the same kid. Back. Oh, my God, wow. And it was like, you know, you break the ice. It was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. You know, here I'm hanging with Pat Thrall. Um, you know, and so we started blaming doors down. We did, we played the, uh, the Roxy with Vandenberg, mm -hmm. right when uh, Burning Heart was, no, was you know, high on the, on the playing list there. Mm -hmm. uh, we did, like I said, with Quiet Riot. Uh, it was... It was Perkins Palace only holds so many people legally. It was double that easily when, when we, we supported Quiet Riot. Yeah. And right after that, there was no stopping us. Troubadour, country club, show after show, packed house, packed house. Lines out, outside, up the block, and around the corner. You guys play with uh, Motley Crue at the no. Roxy? Oh, I, oh. I was I was not in the band oh, at that point. I think that was before me. So, you know, we, we, uh, we made arrangements, or they made arrangements to go up, to, up north to Katati. And uh, and we recorded the Steeler album. How many days? Um, you know, I don't remember exactly how many days it was. I know we stayed in this little. It was on a farm. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a Sunburst Studio or something, something like that. It's it's a. Uh, we stayed in this little guest shack. It was like a more of like a recreation room with pool tables, and it was no insulation. And it was the must have been the coldest time of the year because it was it was definitely below zero something in there. It was it was extremely cold and at mm -hmm. night. Uh, Ingve's fans found out we were in town, or at least north of town. You know, we were north, 50 miles north of San Francisco. We're in wine country, and and horse land, equestrian uh, community, and and the local San Francisco fans found out that Ingve was was nearby, and they demanded Steeler come down and, and in the middle of doing an album and do a show. So Ron asked me to come with him to to their local radio station, and we promoted the show. We played at the old Waldorf. Which was a famous venue. Y and T mm -hmm. was like kings there. Yeah, you know. So we, we we played a show at the old Waldorf, and looking out from the stage, is Ingve is on that side of the stage, and so you draw a line down the center from Ron to his left, and it was all Ingve fans. Right. Everything else was there to see the Steeler. Everyone else on this side, mm -hmm. and and we did the show, and it was it was sweaty, it was it was intense, it was like get in, hit, get out, get back up to the studio, uh, finish recording the album. And as it turns out, Ingve couldn't record on the album at that time. He wasn't uh, legal at that point to, to mm. record. He didn't have a green card. So uh, Dee Dee Keel was busting ass through the State Department as fast as she could to get Ingve a green card because he's not allowed to record until he gets his green card. That's what we were told. So we all came back down to L.A. They're starting to work on, on whatever else they can do on the album. Finally, it comes in. Ingve and Ron go back up north. They finish the album. Ron does his vocals. Ingve does his guitars and everything else. And they come back down, and, and the album's done. Uh, my last show with them, I think it was May, May of 83. And we were supposed to have a band meeting the next day, which Ron was absent. It was just Ingve was gone. It was just me and Mark. Mark says, it folds upon me to say we're going to sack the lineup and start over. So you're going to have to go, Ingve's, Ingve's leaving, he's got a gig. And Andy Truman showed up from the band Alcatraz with a truck and moved all of Ingve's gear out. Ingve goes, see ya, bye. Didn't look back since. Yeah. And he went on with, Ingve, with Alcatraz. Uh, Ron reformed the band, it had Ron Murray on bass and Mitch Perry on guitar. Mm -hmm. Then he sacked that, or, or whatever, and then it was um, Kurt James mm -hmm. and Bobby Marks. And then... And then, uh, uh, on, and then uh, uh, Greg Chase on, mm -hmm. and then that lineup got sacked or changed or whatever you want to call it. Then from that point on, it became Keel. Right, and that's the story of how it happened. I went on with Sin, and <coughs> moved on from there and, and blazed ahead. And I remember and, going to Perkins Palace on the Alcatraz show because I, from Steeler, I was doing promotions and and did work for Rockshire Records that put out Alcatraz. 
we're all there to see Ingve and everything. All of a sudden, we get word he left the band in the middle of the tour. Mm -hmm. And there's this new guy, Steve Vai. Mm -hmm. the, the kids were in the front row like like this, the Ingve yeah. fans. Of course, Steve Vai goes on to his his yeah, fan, but <laughs> people didn't know it was. So uh, a very volatile situation to say the least. Yeah, Ingve looks. Now we've seen him on the, the metal that metal show, and he he says uh, he, he he took the gig with Alcatraz. Overworking with Phil Moog from UFO, uh, because he he got he was told he could write all the songs, and of course got to play with Graham Bonnet, who was in Rainbow, and as we all know, Ingve was a big fan of Richie Blackmore. Right. So by proxy, anything anybody who's worked with Blackmore, Ingve was was cool with, you know. And I I happen to have a CD, made from a cassette tape, of us the Steeler rehearsing. Somebody was running a tape player while we were rehearsing. You can hear the door open and shut to the room. You can mm -hmm. hear TV in the background. And it's us doing most of the stuff from, from the album, rehearsing, and it's tight. I'm here to tell you, it's tight. And then it's just stuff with just me and Ingve, just like you and I having a conversation, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. noodling around. And, stuff. and we're, you know, I was talking about how oh, I like Scorpions, and, like, and Ingve and I would like jam a few measures here and there of some of the stuff that he liked, you know, Uli yeah. Roth and all of that. I said, oh, I love Uli Roth. Yeah. You know, so at that point, I detected no weird vibe, weird vibe between us. It, 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 we got along. All of this this animosity stuff started happening years after the mm -hmm. fact, you know, and and uh, I don't know why, you know, uh, I, I I think I, I created a, a Facebook page called I Want to Steal a Reunion Now, and and some people have complained that that's just futile. Why bother? It ain't gonna happen. Yeah. And I don't want to hear it. it ain't gonna happen. Ron always says never say never, and although Ron is not saying I want to do a Steal a Reunion now, he's saying I'm not ruling it out either. You know, and there's there's reasons why he would rather have some things in place that we discussed uh, about how he would like to do it, and I can respect him for that. But the fans want to see what was done on that first from that first album, you know. And and there's there's the the, the bootleg live album, which so right. technically that's another Steeler album. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually on three Steeler albums. There's the, there's the mm -hmm. Steve first Steeler album. There's the Metal Generation anthology, which has a couple of the live songs that are on the live album. And the live album itself. So I'm actually on three Steeler albums. <laughs> so what are your greatest memories about playing live with Ingve? Because I know it was all about the solo for him. But looking back, what, what were your greatest memories as far as Always on stage, Jay. Always on stage. Yeah. You look at that guy and he looks at you. And for that moment, there's, there's, that, there's the smile, there's the knowing, and there's that magic. And I can sit here today in front of you. And anyone else who sees this and know that I'm confident, I went toe to toe, live with Ingve, mm -hmm. while I was in Steeler, and I can look back at that, and nobody can take that away. That was that was fun. And and when Ingve would blaze off to a solo, and Ron was playing rhythm or or, not, or just sing, and Ron would come over and put his arm around me, and and we look, he'd look at me, I'd look at him. It was the boys, the boys together. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, in in uh, uh, June of 2013. Keel came to town to L.A., played the whiskey. Ron says, how can I come to L.A. without getting in touch with you? And he arranged to have me come up on stage, and Ron and I did a brief reunitement together. Yeah. And, and we did... Uh, Cold Day in Hell. Cold Day in Hell. <clears throat> and when I walked on stage, they played the, the, uh, the Steeler uh, theme, uh, Abduction, which I wrote. All two notes of it. <laughs> mm. uh, which is essentially all it is. Uh, he, they played the intro, I walked on stage... And it was like the Country Club, 1983, all over again. The mm -hmm. fans went nuts. They were, I, I was just overwhelmed to see that many people going, yeah, you yeah. know. And and the hair stood up on my arms. I looked, I walked out. I looked at Ron. Ron looked at me, and that that smile from back in '83 never it never wavered. It was still there. Yeah. Was, that's that's what I got from it. That's and we great. did Cold Day in Hell, and Ron and I looked at each other in the eye. And anybody who's there, you can see the video on YouTube. You can see the magic. It, it was still there, mm. you know. And then, uh, then Ron did a, a, an acoustic version of Serenade, which I'd never mm -hmm. played live. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a copy of it. Mm. So Ron turns around and goes, just follow me. So I sat down, and I changed bases. I sat down on the riser, and I played along with him. Then he came over and sat down, and we both sat there, and we played. And we got up, and we, and we played together, and he just came over and leaned at me, and he just leaned his forehead into mine, and we were like nose to nose, eye to eye. And it was just like I said, like, like the magic of 1982 yeah, all course. over again. No, it's, uh, you, you it's amazing stuff. You can't sit there and go, mm -hmm. that never happened, because it did. Well, for history's sake, the first time Metallica ever appeared on an album was Metal Massacre mm -hmm. 1, Metal Blade's first record, and cut one, side one of that record was Cold, Cold Day, Day in Hell. Hell. With the original First clip. pressing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. So, historically speaking, you know, there was a lot to say about that lineup, and certainly back in the day, Metallica opened for Steeler yeah. at the Whiskey. Yeah. I have know. to say, Ron took a massive leap of faith, taking one of the top bands in L.A., sacking the lineup and replacing it without losing momentum, getting even better players. I mean, at least, well, visually, Ingve was better musically than anybody. So yeah. I'm not saying, not putting down the guys he had in the band. <clears throat> but he put together such a, a, an impactive lineup without losing any momentum. So, so, again, he took such a leap of faith, and he succeeded mm -hmm. until he changed the lineup again. So, you know, I was just, I, I'm, I'm glad that I could say I was part of that, that part of metal history in L.A. Yeah. You know, Steeler was and all will always be a seminal cornerstone in metal, rock mm -hmm. and roll in Los Angeles in the 80s. Because yeah. so many bands copied or followed in our wake afterwards. I had big shoes to fill, and anyone after us had big shoes to fill. But they didn't look at it that way. They just went out and did the gig and like yeah. that. You know, Greg Chason's a great bass player. I know him and the whole Chason clan. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm friends with Kirk James to this day. Mm -hmm. He's even he's, he's we're we're buzzing back and forth in each other's ear about possibly put, doing like a Steeler tribute or something. Mm -hmm. But technically, you'd have two two band members from Steeler. Yeah, half of it. Um, we sure would love to convince Ron. You know, to have Kirk James, myself, and Ron. There's three members of Steeler. Mark can't do it because he's got a back injury. Yeah. From from motocross, he's alive and well, but he just can't play drums. But uh, after I walked off the stage with Keel at at the whiskey. Uh, Fred Corey was in the audience and walked up to us and said, Hey, you know, if you guys do a reunion, he goes, I'd like to throw my hat in the ring. Now, I've known Fred since he arrived in L.A. and played with London. He liked my band Sin. We've always been friends. Mm -hmm. He'd call me up when Cinderella came to town to come and see us. Mm -mm. I, I have no, no problems with him playing drums. I would miss playing with Mark, but I would have no problems playing with, with Fred Corey if, if Ron said, Okay, Let's do a reunion and have Fred on drums. Because that would be awesome. There's pros and cons. You know, you, do you do it with Ingve for the Ingve fans and the draw power, or do you do it with somebody else and and just take your chances? You know, I'll take it either way. You know, I was, sure. I was in the band, so I'll go either way. Yeah, knowing the wild card of Ingve, yeah, you might have to have the backup plan. <laughs> yeah, so if, if, if Ingve, as he said, looks at Steeler as moving backwards, and, and just is not into it. If he can't put aside old feelings and old weirdness and vibes and stuff, and just for the for the sake of the sake of the team, take the hit for the team and do it as, you know, if he can't do that, then uh, I can't speak for him. But it, I, I would I would have to disagree with that. I'd say you know what, swallow it and just come and do it. Come play with the band. It's a string of days, maybe four it's 30 days. Thirty something, forty, thirty something years later. Come on, man. Yeah, play L.A. Vegas in the Bay. Yeah, you just know. do a few few shows. Do it for charity. Yeah. You know, this way there's no egos. You know, mm -hmm. it's 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 the it's three of us out of four of us. You know, and and let's do something for charity. Let's do something for St. Jude's Children's or, or any of the City of Hope cancer you know hospitals. Do it for charity. You know, steal mm -hmm. a reunion, do it for charity. I think it's a great idea. We'll talk about your greatest memories of the scene because obviously, as we know, Sunset Strip was filled between Gazaris and the whiskey, and of course the, even the Central and all that over there. The rainbow, I mean, just the energy of the fans, the flyers. I mean, from poison to rat, to Inches thick great the... white. I mean, the flyers, the print stores were yeah. going crazy. I, I know that's one of the reasons why CC was brought into poison. His his mother or relative owned a print Pritchard, store yeah, in yeah. West Hollywood. Yeah, and they had stacks at every Palladium show, every yeah. whiskey show. I got to meet uh, when I met Bobby Dahl for the first time. He mm -hmm. told me that they moved into the old Steeler Mansion. Mm -hmm. What was the Steeler Mansion? Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, of all the places, he described the whole inside. He goes, but of all the places, he goes, I like the best. He goes, when you walk in, but there's the rehearsal room, and there was this room off to the right. Mm -hmm. And he says, and it was set up, it was like the most nicely decorated of, of the whole place. He said <laughs> there was like an upper berth, like you'd see in a train, like a coach berth, and curtains, and, and it was and a carpeting. And I said, that was my room. <laughs> When I moved in, yeah. I decorated the place, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and uh, of course, after I decorated, everybody else, you know, came and looked at it and went, just didn't look as Spartan as theirs. I, I Creature comforts. You know, when it rained, the water came through the bricks, Yeah. but, but we, we had a heater there to try and keep it back. Other than that, you know, I try to make it uh, comfortable, and Bobby goes, that was my room. That was, that was and I, that's how we bonded, Yeah. you know, and then, and then Cece reminded me, 
He never lived there. No, no, not that. It's, <laughs> the memory of Cece goes back to New York. I only I forgot. Um, I, I was working at a, a club called Great Gildersleeves on the Bowery, which is just up a few doors from CBGB's. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the beginning and mid-range touring acts would come play through there, as well as the local scene. And, and when I wasn't playing, I was doing lights for other bands. I did follow spot and house lights. And I'm standing up on the, on the thing there doing the follow spot, and there was this CC reminded me, he goes, I was the kid, I was pulling on your pants like going, hey, 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 hey. And, and he's like, get out of here, kid, you, you're bugging me, I, I'm busy here. He goes, that was me. You were the guy doing the follow spot. I was pulling on your pants going, hey, 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 hey. And I'm like, that was you? He goes, that was me. I was too young to get in the club and I got it. That was my memory of CC. Wow. So it's interesting how your pants cross. And then so many years later, these small, guys go on to become world. massively famous, you know? Yeah. So that was... This, I, but yeah, it was a, gr a great energy. And, and of course, at the time, so many of the bands were getting picked up and making the moves, and MTV was growing leaps and bounds. Steel just missed ball. MTV. Just missed it. Yeah. You know, Mark Workman, as you know, was, was our, our stage manager, lighting guy. Yeah. He had a little... Little. <laughs> by today's standards, it was big. Uh, it was a, a video cassette player and a television with a little screen. And when we weren't playing or working on music, all of us, all the guys in the band, uh, uh, Jimmy and Alan and Pete, the road crew, we'd all gather around that little TV screen, and Mark had re recorded hours and hours of early MTV. Okay. Def Leppard was, uh, Pyromania was in rotation, sure. heavy. photograph. And we'd sit there for hours, and we'd watch whatever he'd bring over on the tape. And that was our, our, our downtime entertainment. Yeah. You know, of course, anybody was sitting with the guitar on his neck. Wherever he went, around that house, yeah. he had the strat around his neck. So, and, and that, was, that was life there. And it's every Sunday we'd go to Mark's house, his girlfriend would make us dinner, mm -hmm. you know, Asian food. And, and that was pretty much how we ate, because we were starving. Mm -hmm. You know, I learned new ways of, of how to make, uh, different ways to make, creative ways to make Top Ramen from mm -hmm. Jimmy. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and yeah. Pete, Pete Ikovsky, I miss the guy, you know, my, my favorite Croatian. Uh, and he's always complaining about something. You know, in that in that broken Slavic tongue, and and uh, but I, I I dug Pete, I really dug Pete. I miss him. I, I miss all the guys. I miss Jimmy and Alan too. You know. Yeah. Uh, I I have to say that in that small time I was with Steeler, I got very spoiled because I I never had to touch my bass until I was stepping into the strap and putting it on to play because you know uh, Jimmy would always take care of the guitars mm -hmm. and he tune it, maintenance everything. You know, and 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 uh, if I'm not playing it, Jimmy was Jimmy was having the safekeeping, so that was kind of really cool. I appreciate it. So I got spoiled with that, you know. Yeah. So. What's well, amazing times to reminisce, Rick? We appreciate that, and can't wait to hear from some future music. That's why I'm writing a book. I've got all kinds of stories. <laughs> can't <laughs> wait. From New York, from the very beginning, my early life, what made me who I am, and how I got on the path, and where it led to to the, till today. So I'm I'm happy to, to to do this for you guys. Yeah. Well, we'll cover that in part two. Oh, bonus. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you to all the fans. Thank you, thank you, and thank you from my heart. Thank you. <laughs>